I've got to be honest, I am still reeling after that loss to Brentford in the last episode. If we would have lost to a Spurs or a Liverpool or a Manchester City, I could have handled that. But losing in the quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup to a team we beat 4-0 earlier in the season is just so disappointing. Spurs will take on Liverpool in the semis. Brentford will be paired up against Manchester City. And we've been so focused on the Carabao Cup that we've really allowed our Premier League form to slip as well. We find ourselves in ninth position now, really falling off the pace after we began the season, you know, in the top four. We do have a chance to get back on track in the Premier League, though, as we take on Ipswich Town and Aston Villa. We also have a chance today to kickstart another cup run, a tough, tough fixture to get our FA Cup campaign started though, hosting Newcastle United at Craven Cottage. And we do, of course, have the January transfer window to work through. We are putting Alex Awobi, or we have put Alex Awobi on the transfer list. He's 29 years old, he's 77 overall, and he's just so bang average, it's unreal. We've got a lot of centre midfielders already in the squad. We just don't need Alex Awobi. We do need the 9 million that he's worth. Sasha Lukic, another one of those centre midfielders, a very, very crowded area of the squad at the moment. He's just simply not getting game time. I would have been happy to hold on to Sasha Lukic, but he wants out, so he's going to be leaving the club as well. Driwesh and Oyen, we haven't played traditional wide midfielders or wingers a single time this season, so I'm happy for them to test the market. And then a Blade and Wickens are also going to be on the way out. Wiccan's just on a loan to buy deal though. So we should be able to raise somewhere between 15 and 20 million in this window, but I'm honestly not sure where we spend it. We've got Emerson Royale and Barbu at right back. We've got three very strong centre backs. We could do it with a little bit more depth at centre back because Bednarek is our best substitute option and he's not an incredible one. So bringing an additional centre back in would be a potential option. We've got, of course, Rico Henry and Owen Vindahl at left back. Owen Vindahl is another player who could potentially leave the club to raise even more funds. Centre midfield, as we said, is so deep already, as is up front. We've got Sargent, Werner, Paulson, Muniz, Jimenez, Bowie. So many strikers. I don't even know where we would spend that money. So we have added Owen Vindahl to the transfer list as well. We're obviously not forced to sell him. We can monitor the bids that come in as well as those for the other four players on the transfer list but for now we have a game against Ipswich Town to get to. Ipswich having a decent enough season so far and they find themselves in mid-table the bottom half of the table still but they've made some nice additions to their squad as well including Bella Kotchap who could have been a potential target for us at centre-back if we do end up going that way with any funds that we do manage to generate in today's episode. So our strongest 11 does take to the field against Ipswich Town. Timo Werner coming in for Rodrigo Muniz. That's the only position left that you would kind of have a debate about who should get the nod there, but Timo Werner gets it today. And it was important that we got off to a quick start in this one and wrenched momentum back early, and that's exactly what we did. Rico Henry delivering an absolute perfect ball in for Ruben Vargas, who laid himself out with a diving header to make it 1-0. This is a bit of a cagey game, but it was a good controlled performance from us. We very much limited the opportunities that Ipswich had, and whilst they did the same, it was us that was creating the better opportunities, making better use of the possession that we had. And while Sargent couldn't get his initial attempt on target, this opportunity was parried away well by Christian Walton. But it would be Josh Sargent that doubled the lead 75 minutes into the game. The goal entirely created by Diara's perfectly placed chipped through ball over the top of the Ipswich defence. Sargent hit it first time on the half volley for a really tidy finish. This is one of my favourite goals. And from there we just had to see the game out which is exactly what we did. As I said a really controlled, professional, measured performance. Exactly the type of performance that we needed coming off the last episode. And it's exactly the kind of performance we needed as we head into our featured game of the episode against Newcastle United in the FA Cup. An unbelievably strong 11. Newcastle have really utilised their funds well in this particular save. Nick Pope starts in goal. It's going to be a back four of Livramento, Koundé, Upamakano and Matson, Gimaraj, Curtis Jones and Zaire Emery. It's going to be the midfield three and then Daniel Marlon and Anthony Gordon 
flank Victor Jokeres up front. As for Johannes Torrips, 11, just a single change. That's Rodrigo Muniz coming back into the side in place of Timo Werner. Other than that, exactly the same 11 that started against Ipswich. Burned Leno in goal, a back five of Royale, Adrabayo, Jop, Bassi, Henry, Yusuf, Schlager, Vargas continues, I think, to be our best midfield three. Sergeant and Muniz, the pairing up front. We were knocked out by the underdogs in the quarterfinal of the Carabao Cup. So without further ado, let's head over to Craven Cottage, see if we can reverse those roles and be the underdog that knocks out Newcastle. So we are up in the commentary box on a cold and frosty January afternoon here at Craven Cottage with a tough, tough task ahead of us. Kickstart a second cup run and keep that hope of a trophy in our final season here on FC24 alive. We're going to have to overcome Newcastle if we are to do that and the odds are against us. Newcastle's 11 is unreal. One of the stronger... 11s that I have seen outside of the likes of you know Man City but I would say this 11 even rivals that of Arsenal that we saw just an episode or two ago Victor Jokeres up front Daniel Marlin they combined well earlier in the season when we played Newcastle in the Premier League I don't recall the scoreline off the top of my head that day potentially I should have looked beforehand to check in on how we did against them last time out but ultimately that doesn't matter all that matters is how we do against them this time out as Ruben Vargas looks to get Emerson Royale in behind he looks to get Josh Sargent in behind and that's such a good saving challenge Upa Meccano just about recovers position enough to get the foot in before Josh Sargent lets fly and that's an excellent covering challenge from Tosin Adrabayo as well. Did really well to read that ball dropping in behind the back line. But Josh Sargent was just inches and milliseconds away from pulling the trigger there. Whether or not he would have beaten Nick Pope, I'm not sure. But I have faith that he would have at least got a shot on target and tested the Newcastle goalkeeper. That's a really good ball. Yusuf cuts inside. Looking for Sergeant once more. Finding Sergeant once more. Who in turn finds Emerson Royale. Again cuts inside. Not too much on though. Newcastle holding their lines well. And Emerson Royale has been dragged out of position as he presses trying to delay the Newcastle counter-attack. To be fair, he's done exactly that. And he's bought himself enough time to get back in position. And to allow his teammates to do the same. Rico Henry stops the initial cross. Newcastle still in a dangerous area though. Calvin Bassi steps out of his defensive position to press. Bruno Gimaraj just about beats Xaver Schlager. But Bernd Leno ultimately parries away and Anthony Gordon will deliver the corner for Newcastle. First real period of pressure for Newcastle. First real opportunity to test Burned Leno. They've done it once and they've done it for a second time. Another good save at the near post by Leno. Not 100% sure that was on target, but if Leno isn't 100% sure either, then he simply has to parry away. You can't take risks. Jokeres finds Gordon. Sayer so Emery. Gordon inside. Parried away again by Leno. And it's all Newcastle at the moment. We are holding them to shots from distance, to be fair. None of those opportunities were particularly good ones. They wouldn't score particularly highly on XG. And Leno was fairly comfortably equal to them. And we can break away on this left-hand side now. Muniz just kind of holding his position and allowing Yusuf to break forward. Does turn back to Rico Henry, though, who cuts inside. He's a Jop. Jop, I think, is the player in the starting 11 most at risk of having that place 
uh, what would you say? Stolen, usurped by a new addition in January. Emerson Royale tries to cross. It's blocked. He'll try again. He'll find the head of a Newcastle defender, unfortunately. Jop, I think, has been more than solid at the back. As have Bassi and Adrabayo. There have been the odd game or two, though, where we've just absolutely shipped goals. I mean, Nottingham Forest 7-2 springs to mind. That's a brave, brave header from Tino Livramento. As Rodrigo Muniz was shaping to strike on the volley, Livramento stooped in to head that clear. And I think if we were to point to a weak link along the back line... It would be Issa Jot. He has the least pace out of everybody across the back line. And we do commit bodies forward, especially out on the flanks. You know, we do leave Xaver Schlager in to cover the back three. But he, of course, plays in a central position. So to cover those flanks, it is Bassi, Adrabayo who get dragged wide. Good save, Burn Leno. Really quick off his line to thwart Newcastle there. And when Bassi and Adrobio are pulled wide, that obviously leaves Issa Giop kind of isolated centrally. And that can be an issue with, with pace. So I do have my eye on a centre-back. He would be fairly expensive. So that does depend on what's happening with the likes of Alex Awobi, Owen Vindahl. Sasha Lukic has left the club. He is the one player transfer listed whose departure has already been confirmed. We will go through the departures in a bit more detail later in the episode. But Sasha Lukic makes his way out of the club. Alex Awobi has been... Really good feat by Zaya Emery. Oh my god. Just absolutely dancing through our back line. And that's exactly... That's exactly what I'm talking about in terms of... And again. And it's another good save by Bernd Leno. I think offside on that particular occasion. I think we can strengthen that back three. I think that would be the best use of our funds. But Alex Iwobi has also been the target of a bid as has Owen Vindahl so we could see all three of them leave the young wingers also we have received offers for so we could potentially raise as much as what 30 million to spend and I think we could certainly add a centre back of a high high calibre for that amount of money Yusuf brings it down on the edge of the box. Finds Rico Henry once more. Can he deliver? Just about finds Sargent and we force the first save from Nick Pope. Rico Henry, I think, despite a bit of a slow start to his Fulham career, has established himself as the starting left back. In the first episode or two, it looked as though we potentially could have made a mistake in signing Rico Henry. And... You know, bringing in somebody ahead of Owen Vindahl. Because Vindahl was playing much, much better to start the season. Rico Henry really has settled in, though. And he's kind of playing almost the Marius Wolf role. That he played for Norwich City in Season 1 and Season 2. Just bombing down that left-hand side. Obviously the opposite flank. But playing the same role from that opposite flank. Just hold your position, Sergeant. And he's been responsible for a number of assists in recent games. Not least the opener in the Ipswich game to kickstart this episode. Calvin Bassi just about gets back in the play there. Zaver Schlager. Can we launch a quick counter-attack down this left-hand side? We can through Rico Henry. Who finds Rodrigo Muniz. Who finds Henry once more. And he's going to be responsible for another assist. He's not... He was almost responsible for the goal there. Henry shooting rather than crossing as we usually see him do. And Upa Makano clears off the line. 
I thought that was going to bounce over before he was able to hook clear. Upa Meccano is unreal. And it's going to be Newcastle to score at the other end. And it's not. It's going to be Bern Leno who keeps things level. But this game has been cracked wide open at the end of this first half. Upa Meccano. How did he manage to get back there in time? He's an insane player. He's always so good. He's so big and so strong, but so quick as well. And such good defensive attributes. He's not just, you know, an athlete at the back. He can genuinely defend. Intelligent defender as well as we've seen there. Sergeant into the box. Uh, it's not Schlager, it's Yusuf arriving late and parried away by Nick Pope. What an unbelievable save. And what an unbelievable end to the first half. Both teams have chances to score. With fewer than five minutes left to play, Ruben Vargas will deliver the corner across the near post. Pope, I think, is going to come and claim, and he does. Muniz had two bites at the cherry there. Couldn't turn it towards goal with either. And I'm not sure which team is going to be... That's so poor. I'm not sure which team is going to be happier with a 0-0 at half-time. Newcastle have had the better of the first half on the balance of play. Fairly comfortably, I would say. But I would argue we've had the best chances of the first half. We've come closest to scoring, without doubt. You know, Upa Meccano literally saved, saved a goal there, obviously. But we were inches away from putting the ball over the, over the line. Newcastle haven't quite, clump, quite come that close. However, they have had the better of the first half. Just Josh Sargent threw on goal, though. Can he take the lead? Yes, he can. And we do take the lead. Neither team is going to be happier with the nil-nil at halftime. Because it's not going to be nil-nil at halftime. Sargent does put the ball over the, the line and into the back of the net. And it's a similar goal to the second against Ipswich that kick-started this episode. The cottage in the corner there looked absolutely unreal. Bit of a side note as I'm talking through Josh Sargent's opening goal, but I just caught a glimpse of it there. You would expect the pitch to have snow and frost on it, as it obviously does. I didn't really anticipate those kind of things being added to the stadium, but you can see there along the roof. I mean, you can't now because Daniel Marlin's fat head is covering it. But there's frost along the roof of the stands and in the little cottage in the corner as well of the stadium. Never really noticed that before, but it looked really cool. And yeah, uh, oh, a 1 0 lead at half time. Thank you for checking out this episode of our Realistic Norwich City career mode. If you're enjoying the content, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We're approaching the end of the FC24 cycle now, but there'll be plenty more content to come with the release of FC25, including 12th Man memberships. If you want to get more involved with the channel, check out the membership tiers on my homepage. Memberships start at less than £2 per month and come with a whole host of benefits and rewards, including you being able to feature in my career mode saves. We'll be starting a road to glory with a created club as soon as FC25 drops. So if you want to be included in the save or even feature in our starting 11, become a 12th man member of the channel today. 12th man members also get exclusive early access to all of my videos, not only my career mode series, but also my realistic slider sets and everything else in between. If you want more information about exactly what each tier involves, be sure to check out this video on my homepage. If memberships aren't for you, you can also join the public area of my Discord server or just keep watching and enjoying the content for free right here on YouTube. As always, I appreciate all of your encouragement and support. Now, let's get back to the video. So back out for the second half here at Craven Cottage, and I'm going to try and ramble less at the beginning of the second half than I did at the end of the first half. Got a little bit carried away there with the frost on the roof. Struggling to find my words for Josh Sargent's goal as well. 
but we are composed. We've taken a few breaths. And we are ready to defend this one goal lead. Issa Diop, Adrabayo, finds Royale. Nice little run from Ruben Vargas. And Emerson Royale finds him. Vargas lifts it into the box where Yusuf is at the back post. Trying to turn the ball goalwards. Sargent tries to lay it off to Zeva Schlager. And gets it all wrong. Newcastle can come away. We just need to defend in this second half. We defended decently in the first half. We did allow Newcastle a few too many shots on goal for my liking. That's so well read by Calvin Bassey. And strong enough to hold off the Newcastle players initially. Doesn't stop. It's Anthony Gordon it is getting a shot away though. Again parried away by Bernd Leno. Again, relatively comfortable. It was close enough to him to not cause too much of an issue. It was the pace on the strike that could potentially have caused the problem. But two strong hands to the ball from Leno, and what a save that is. Absolutely unreal stop from Daniel Marlin, who I think has probably just had Newcastle's best opportunity of the game. That's tucking right in the far corner, and Bernd Leno just throws out a left hand to parry it away but we are for now riding this early storm in the second half get your foot in sergeant Jones strikes now no not like this not like this as if that's the way that Newcastle equalise Curtis Jones strikes from range does it take two deflections there? Definitely takes a deflection off Adrabayo. I'm not sure if it even caught Zaver Schlager on the way through as well. Regardless, Bernd Leno obviously had no chance. He was mid-air when it took the deflection. He was sprawled out on the ground when it bounced over the line. That's so harsh. Oh, and we have to bounce back from that. Bassi just about gets there. Finds Rico Henry. Make that run. Henry into that space. I didn't initiate a 1-2 pass, to be fair. And I should have done. Because if I did, I, I think Rico Henry would have got in behind Tino Livramento there. And instead, I was trying to initiate the run. After I'd already taken a touch or two with Yusuf. Save a Schlager. Strikes from range. What a strike it is, but parried away well by Nick Pope. Vargas takes a tumble, and I think it's going to be a goal kick. Played it off the Newcastle man initially. But it must have rebounded against Vargas as he took a tumble. And it is out for a goal kick. Yusuf wins the header. Can't find Josh Sargent, though. Does win the ball back, though, and then finds Sargent. But the Newcastle defender just about gets a toe on it. The sergeant tries to play it through to Muniz. Livramento high up the field. Space in behind. But he does, of course, have an unbelievable amount of pace to recover. Anthony Gordon. 2-1 Newcastle. Really good move, to be fair. Really good move, to be fair. I was just half a step behind every step of the way there really good passing move from Newcastle when they have the lead Marlin into Jokeresh pulls it back, Gordon's all alone Adrabayo doesn't know whether to come across to Gordon which to be fair he probably should or whether to hold his position not sure where Jock was really you would expect Jock to have been there but players pulled out of position by just the Pace and efficiency of that Newcastle attack. And we find ourselves 2-1 down. It's probably not undeserved, to be fair. Newcastle have been the better side. They have had more opportunities. And they have had a handful of very good opportunities now. That was the one thing we could say about the first half. That whilst Newcastle had a number of shots on goal. Calvin Bassey! Calvin Bassey! Oh my god! That would have been the goal of the year. Not just of the season, not just of the series, but of FC24. Calvin Bassey, where did that come from? 
Mr. Chiop comes across. This is where his pace is exposed. This is exactly what I was talking about earlier. He does so well, though. And that's why I, I, I have been fine with Issa Diop in the side. Because he's such a good defender. It's just that pace that can leave him exposed a little bit from time to time. And Newcastle can just keep the ball now. They don't have to press as hard as they have been. Jokeres into Marlon. Back to Jones. And they can just keep the ball in our final third and just work it around. We are obviously the team that's chasing at the moment. Chasing the ball and chasing the scoreline. Good save. Burn Leno does really well to keep hold of it, especially in the frosty weather. Rico Henry. Yusuf makes one of the runs into the channel that we like so much. Rico Henry finds him. Sergeant wants it at the back post. Pope. Just parries it up into the air. Muniz. Doesn't get anywhere close with the attempted header. It's Ava Schlager. Another really good effort. Another really good save. I think I timed that well with a little bit of time finishing. Wasn't enough to beat Nick Pope, though. So Ruben Vargas preparing to take the corner, but he is going to... No, he's not going to make way. I changed my mind. I was about to bring Ruben Vargas off. I brought Yusuf off instead so that we can have two attacking midfielders, two creative players in Vargas and Pereira. Sergeant in the near post! Grabs the equaliser! Second goal in the game for Josh Sargent. Levels up the scoring, and I'm very, very glad I didn't take Ruben Vargas off now. Because he was the man that found the head of Sargent at the near post. I think I can count on one hand the number of goals we've scored from corners this season, but there is an all-important one. Bounces off the body of Tino Livramento as Nick Pope dives away to his left-hand side to try and get there. And it's going to go down as a Livramento own goal. You can't possibly call that an own goal. It's clearly on target. It's clearly going in. The deflection off Livramento is completely inconsequential. And yet they've credited it to Tino Livramento instead of Josh Sargent. So we'll have to remember at the end of the season when we come to tally up the total goals scored that we're going to have to add one to Josh Sargent because that's not going to be overturned. No, Marlon. Good save, Leno at the near post. Just really unfortunate little kind of deflection and rebound there, allowing Daniel Marlin to grab the ball and leaving our players completely out of position. Andreas Pereira bursts forward. Sergeant at the back post stops his run for some reason. Not quite a corner. Hooked away. Emerson Royale, though, to take the throw in. Finds Sergeant. Can't beat Upa Meccano. As I said, just unreal. Just an unreal defender in this game. I've never really played with him. I don't think I played with him at all in FC24. I think I did on FIFA 23 for a bit. But certainly a player I should look to sign at some point if it's appropriate for the club. We tend to use smaller clubs on the channel. Andres Pereira, really good position. Couldn't quite find him with the cross. Obviously, he wouldn't have been a, a realistic signing for Everton at any point. Norwich, Fulham, obviously we wouldn't be signing him for them. Crystal Palace is going to be our first FC25 career mode team. But if we use a bigger club at any point, I think Upa Meccano certainly is going to be a target. Schlager! Parried away by Nick Pope. There were runs in behind there from Sergeant Muniz Vargas. Schlager just using them as kind of diversions, though. Allowing those runs to pull the Newcastle defenders back and away. Opening up the space for Vargas to get the shot away. And Pereira is going to deliver the corner this time. This time finds Muniz and again parried away at the near post by Nick Pope. It's going to be slightly lower and flatter and across the near post this time from Pereira. And I got a little bit too much on that. Ruben Vargas does win the header, though. Does pick up an injury in the process, but it is going to be yet another corner. 
but not before we make two additional substitutions. It's going to be Rodrigo Muniz and Ruben Vargas off. Yusuf Paulson and Diara on to replace them. So two like-for-like -like changes. And Pereira will again deliver the corner, this time from the opposite side. And Paulson already making a nuisance of himself in the Newcastle United penalty area. Newcastle looking to break. Down this right-hand side through Daniel Marlin. Jules Kunde has been fairly quiet at the back today. He's making his debut for Newcastle. I didn't realise that before I saw that little cutscene in the intro to the game. But Kunde and Upa Meccano, what an unreal pairing at centre-back for Newcastle. Marlon finds Livramento. He's got to get there, Leno. He doesn't. And I think it's offside anyway. And it is. Just about offside, Victor Jokeres. Adrabayo. Both teams looking for a winner late in the game here. Alvin Bassi, I'm not sure where he's going, but it opens up a bit of space for Issa Diop to step into. We can't quite find Diara on the first attempt. We can on the second. Josh Sargent through on goal. Can he beat the final man and get a shot away? I probably should have taken a shot on earlier. Sargent finds Paulson and he can't get the shot away. And I think it's going to be a Newcastle free kick. How is the ball not in the back of the net? How is the ball not in the back of the net there? Sergeant declines the shot. Tries to beat his man. That allowed the space to close. But he manages to pull it back across goal and finds use of Paulson. But I think it must have been Jules Kunde. All happened in a bit of a flash there. Kunde or Rupa Meccano, I assume Kunde. Manages just about to get in at the back post and prevent use of Paulson from turning that ball into an empty net. Herrera can't quite get there. We look the team with the impetus though going into the last 10 minutes or so of the game. And just as I say that, Newcastle launch an attack of their own. And it's an absolutely unreal finish. Absolutely unreal. Outside of the foot, Harvey Barnes. Curls into the top corner where nobody is ever getting to it. And again, Jock out of position slightly. Or is that Calvin Bassey? Really great angle, that. Oh, I mean, the goal ultimately is my fault. Because I stepped up with Diara to try and win the ball back in midfield whereas I should have just held my position and that's what opened up the space in behind for Calvin Bassi and Issa Diop to be isolated and exposed like that so potentially Bassi or Diop were kind of superficially at fault for the goal but ultimately it was it was Diara and it was my input that allowed the space for Newcastle there. And to be fair, even with the space that Harvey Barnes had, that's an unreal finish. Herrera, Diara can't quite find him. That's an unreal finish. Even with the ball in that position, Harvey Barnes should, should not be... He has no right to put Newcastle 3-2 up there. And we've obviously stepped up into our ultra-attacking game plan now, so... Spaces are opening in behind. It's a really, really poor pass. Didn't put anywhere near enough on it to find Sargent. We do this time, and Sargent can come away on the left-hand side. Not as fast as Tino Livramento, but does have more energy. More energy than Kunde as well. Finds Paulson. Upa Meccano to beat. He does beat him, though. And Yusuf Paulson puts it wide. I knew as soon as I took my thumb off B, that was going wide. Oh, we don't deserve anything from the game. We don't deserve anything from the game. The equaliser was there. We didn't take it. I just, I knew I'd pulled it wide. I could just, I could just feel it. And I've mentioned before about, you know, when the manual passing feels kind of wonky... 
and the ball doesn't quite go where you're aiming it because you absolutely can feel whether the ball is going where you're aiming it and it did unfortunately go where I aimed it there I could feel that I'd pulled it too far to the left I could feel that that was going wide as soon as I powered up the shot and that was the opportunity our FA Cup run begins and ends in a single game and it disappears with that final opportunity of the game for Yusuf Paulson. Of course, we would have had to go on and won the game from there. It would have taken a, a, a replay if we couldn't grab a winner. Oh, that just feels like such a disappointing way to go out. Disappointing not only because we had an opportunity to equalise at the very, very end of the game, but because Newcastle's initial equaliser was so fortunate. On the balance of play, maybe Newcastle had enough to win it. I don't know, though. We had a, a, a number of really, really good opportunities over the course of the game. I think a draw and a replay probably would have been fair. Whether or not we would have beaten Newcastle at St. James's Park to progress is a debate for another day but now though we have the transfer market to focus on as Alex Awobi becomes the second player to leave Craven Cottage Sasha Lukic has already made his way out of the club Alex Awobi follows him we'll have to see if Owen Vindal is close behind as well so Awobi leaves for 9.7 million Sasha Lukic for 8.5 which leaves us with a little under 18 million in the transfer budget at this moment in time so Owen Vindal could well be playing his last game for Fulham as we take on Aston Villa in the final game of today's episode Jan Be Bed Norek also comes into the back five Andreas Pereira comes into the midfield and Timo Werner rejoins Josh Sargent up front and we do come away with the victory we smashed Aston Villa in the opening game of the series 4-0 uh, here it's just 2-1, but Timo Werner opens the scoring in the first half. Ollie Watkins misses a penalty in the 63rd minute, grabs an equaliser anyway five minutes later, but just a minute later, Tosan Adrabayo grabs the winner. What a crazy six minutes that was. And Owen Vindal will be leaving the club. That was his final game for Fulham against Aston Villa. He has his pick of clubs as well. I'm not sure who he selected to go to. Newcastle wearing for him, West Ham we're in for him as well and it is going to be Newcastle United so they strengthen their back line even further so that leaves us with a massive 37 million in the transfer budget and it's our last season it's our last series it's our last couple of episodes on FC 24 I'm spending all of that money but spend it on who that is the question there are three center backs I'm very interested in Jan Orel Bissek Plays for Inter Milan, so I'm not sure he's the most realistic option. I have checked out their centre-backs as well. He is one of only four centre-backs on the team, and he's probably one of the higher rate. He's probably a starter, basically. I'm not sure it's realistic enough that we bring him in, but he looks unreal. 80 overall, three play styles, high, high work rates, 82 pace, 86 physical. Only 76 defending, though. Saul Coco would certainly be more, uh, a more realistic option. Also 80 overall, 26 years of age. Couple of good play styles in jockey and anticipate. 84 pace, 80 defending, 81 physical. And then Mika Marmol, a, a smaller player at the back, certainly. 6 foot 158 is, he would easily be our smallest centre back. But high attacking work rate, 80 overall, just 24 years of age, is left footed. So perhaps we would have to move Calvin Bassey into the center of the back three. Does have Tiki Taka and Intercept, which are some interesting play styles. 85 pace, 79 defending, 79 physical. 23 and a half for Bissek, 19 and a half with a 34 and a half release clause for Coco. 24 and a half with a 53 and a half release clause for Marmol. Okay, so it has been narrowed down to two. We cannot afford the release clause for Marmol. It is over 50 million and the club isn't willing to let him go. So that narrows it down to either Bissek or Coco. Bissek would be available for 26 million. Coco available for 24 million. 
I have also had my eye on another centre midfielder, though. We've waved goodbye to a couple in this window. Alex Awobi and Sasha Lukic. So David Alaru arrives as a replacement. A player I've had my eye on for a long time and a player Johannes Hoftorup was planning to sign for Norwich City. Never ended up panning out, but he does arrive to play for Johannes Torup now, but in Fulham colours. And I did get his name wrong. It's actually Darius Alaru. But he looks really, really good. 83 pace, 82 physical, really balanced midfielder with high, high work rates, four-star skill moves, five-star weak foot, incisive pass, anticipate, technical, relentless, only a 76 overall at 27 years of age, but just looks like a, such a fun, well-rounded centre midfielder. I think I will go for Bissek. It's probably not the most realistic option, but as I said, it's the very last series season career mode save of FC24. Let's have a little bit of fun. Let's spend a little bit of money and let's try and finish as high as we possibly can in the Premier League because that is all we have left to play for now. So Bisek does arrive to join the likes of Adrabayo, Bassi, Jop, Bednarek in the back three. I think Bisek is the best option and I think he'll step in for Issa Diop in the centre of that back three immediately and really solidify that back line. So transfer deadline day does arrive once more. We can't afford to do any more business. We have no money to buy players. We can't afford to let any go. So although Brighton are putting in an offer for Yusuf, although Bournemouth putting in an offer for Mbabu, neither of those players will be leaving the club. So we will allow the final hour of deadline day to tick away. And we will allow the calendar to tick over into February where we have five games to get to really really difficult month manchester city at home opens the episode both north london clubs in tottenham and arsenal will follow before we host crystal palace at craven cottage and travel down to the amex to take on brighton and hove albion so getting back to winning ways in the premier league is at least some consolation for getting knocked out of the fa cup at the first attempt by newcastle doesn't look like we're going to be winning a trophy in the final season of FC24 after all. Unless, of course, we go on some unbelievable run in the last four months of the season and somehow win the Premier League. Incredibly unlikely, but we'll try and do that in the next episode, I guess. I hope to see you there. Take it easy.